Now, John chapter 3, most people, as soon as you say John chapter number 3, what do they think of? Verse number 16. But John chapter number 3, if you read it in its entirety, is a chapter of questions. From beginning to end, you find people asking questions and receiving answers from either the Lord or from the forerunner of Christ, John the Baptist. And just by way of introduction, we don't have time to read the whole chapter today, and you all should be saying amen on that. But... Uh, Let's look at a few of these questions. Verse number 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter in the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Then we, verse number 7, he says, Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Okay, that was the answer essentially to that question. Then Nicodemus answered and saying to them, How can these things be? Then Jesus answered. Then we get down to, you know, verse number 25. It says, And there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, and the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set uh, to st hath set to his seal that God is true, for whom for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. We'll stop reading right there. Now, Jesus gave a longer answer to that, to how can these things be, when Nicodemus asked him. But all of John chapter number 3 is either a question or an answer. John chapter number 3 starts off, Nicodemus came to him by night. Nicodemus being a Pharisee. Now, why did Nicodemus have questions? Well, first off, it was bothering him pretty bad because he didn't come when it was convenient. He came at night. Now, some people have said that, you know, that was for fear of the other Pharisees and fear of the Jews because he was a leader. Very well may, may have been, but the Bible doesn't say so. Could have been that he had been wrestling with it all day and he finally had enough and said, I'm going to go get an answer. I don't know. That's just one of them things. Maybe that's in a half that had not been told yet. I don't know. But we do know that Nicodemus had some questions. And Jesus knew he had questions because as soon as he showed up, Jesus started giving him some answers. Okay, I mean, we can go back to verse number 3. And it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again. Right? Well, if you read verses 1 and 2, he says, there's no question in there. He's just saying, we know that you came from heaven. We know that you've got to be you know, God's got to at least be with you because you can't do all the things that you do unless God's with you. Then in verse number three, Jesus is already answered. Now that means respond also. But in that answer, Nicodemus had some questions answered, but then he also had a few more. Because then, very next verse, Nicodemus said, that, how can a man be born when he is old? How can he be born again? And then Jesus answers him and then in verse uh, number 9, Nicodemus answered and said, how can these things be? So he had an answer, but he didn't understand the answer. Then Jesus spends you know, a good bit after that answering him. And then it says, after these things, in verse number 22, came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried uh, with them and baptized. And then it goes on to tell you that John the Baptist hadn't yet been thrown into prison. So he's there with John the Baptist, baptizing people. And then some of the Jews, we might be able to call them devout, very well could have been Pharisees or, you know, Sadducees or maybe some of the scribes. But they argued with the disciples of John the Baptist concerning the issue of purity. Now this, this is a different group of people. Nicodemus, being a Pharisee, he knew the Old Testament, but he hadn't learned much about grace. Although... Noah did find grace in the eyes of God. You can find grace in the Old Testament. But Nicodemus was a man that had his mind on the law all the time. 
And he thought that the law is what would justify us. Now, the people that followed after John, they had heard that, you know, there was a wild man out there in camel hair eating honey and locusts that was preaching the kingdom of God out in the wilderness, saying, hey, he's coming. He promised he would. And, I mean, we can go back and look at everything that the prophet said, find where he would be born, that, you know, he'd be born of a virgin, and all, everything about it, but they just weren't looking for him. That's why John the Baptist was there. Hey, he's coming. But the people that believed John the Baptist, his disciples, they had learned a few things. They were not unfamiliar with the things of God. They were not unacquainted with the teachings that you must be born again. Their dispute or their uncertainty, verse number 25, was about purifying. In other words, the Jews, which is who they had a dispute with, when they came in verse number 26 and asked the question, they said, Behold, the same baptizeth, referring to Jesus, and all men come unto him. Now this is the same argument that they were having over in the book of Acts and a few times after that where some thought, well, you couldn't really be saved unless you circumcised in the flesh. You really couldn't be saved if you didn't do this or if you didn't do that. Adding to or taking away from the things of God is what it is. But here they're saying, well, surely only the just, surely only those that have been purified through either sacrifice or through deed or through act Certainly only those can come and be baptized and receive Christ. That's what the Jews are saying. And the people that were following after John, they had never thought about it before because it hadn't bothered them up until that point. They say, you know what? It kind of raises a good point. So they came to John the Baptist. John the Baptist verbally smacked him upside the head and said, hey, listen here. You've heard everything that I've taught since I started teaching. And he says, none of that matters. Eventually, he comes down and he says, He that cometh from above is above all. Then, three verses before that, Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. Then the verse before that, A man can receive nothing except to be given from heaven. What's that mean? I testified about somebody else, and you heard my testimony. The one that I testified about was Christ, who's above all because he came from above all. And no man can have anything except it was given to him from heaven. What does that mean? The one that came from heaven was given something from heaven to those people. And if God didn't have a problem giving it to him, why do we have a problem with it? That's the logic that he was walking them through. That's the mindset that they should have had. Because he said, you've borne me witness. You've heard what I preached. Okay, now those questions different types of questions and we'll get into them here in a second but those types of questions are not necessarily a bad thing questions just mean that you're confronted with something and you're unsure about it okay now that could be a bad thing and we'll get into that here in a second also but what, what do questions questions come from uncertainty not a lack of faith because the opposite of faith is doubt Uncertainty is, I do not know. And when f faced with that decision, you've got one of two things. You could either search for the answer, or you could try to figure it out yourself. Because the Jews that came to the disciples of John the Baptist, they had had an issue with it before they came and brought the issue up to John's disciples. They were saying, well, hang on. This is different than what we were taught. So why is that happening? Why does Jesus receive all men unto him? Why is he out there baptizing anybody that comes to him? And they came up with the answer on their own and then tried to argue it with John the Baptist's disciples, his followers. They tried to reason. So that's the one or two avenues. You, you can either search for the answer or you can try to figure it out yourself. Now, these questions come from uncertainty. And so, with the Lord's help this morning, we're just going to teach on from uncertainty to certainty. From uncertainty to certainty. Now, we do not know, because the chapter starts off with, Nicodemus came by night. 
We don't know how Nicodemus heard. We don't know if he was in one of the multitudes and heard Jesus preach directly. We don't know if somebody came and told him of the doctrine that Christ had been teaching the other people. But we know that he had heard. And as a result of that, he had some questions. Now, the first type of questions, first group of uncertainty, is when you're confronted with something you've never heard before. It's something new. And it doesn't just apply to lost people. Yeah, you get in this Bible, I don't care how long you've been studying, you'll find something new if you're searching for it. Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. And if any man could understand this book thoroughly, they'd be God. Because 2 Timothy 2.15, Study show thyself approved unto God. In other words, my desire should be to know this book as good as God knows the book. And I'll never attain that until I have a body like his. So you're always going to find something new. But new information requires you to reassess everything that you've known before. Nicodemus came to Christ because he's saying, not verbally, he's saying, I've heard that everything that I believed in isn't going to get me to heaven. He said, that man knew the first five books of what we call the Bible committed to memory. That man daily had to make sure that he was sanctified and purified unto God. That man daily sat and judged other people as according to what God said should have been judged. His entire life, now I'm not saying that he was, but some of them lorded that over other people and used their position as an excuse to be worshipped themselves. But everything that the Pharisees did was situated around the things of God, whether or not they wanted to admit it. And Nicodemus cared enough that he said, I gotta, I gotta find this out. Everything that he did every day, he's sitting there, and either God's dealing with him or his conscience is dealing with him about the fact that, you know what, this is different than what Jesus said. He was confronted with something new and it didn't mesh with what he had already known. And he says, I have to know which one's right. So he came to Jesus by night. Then Jesus says, you can't inherit the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. Well, how can a man be born when he's old? See, this is the first area when you hear something that you've never heard before. You can receive it in the flesh, carnally. Nicodemus is thinking, in the flesh, how can a man be born again? Can he enter into his mother's womb when he's old? Obviously, the answer to that is no. Nicodemus knew that the answer was no. But he said, I, I don't understand. I hear what you're saying, but I don't get it. It's because he was thinking in the flesh. He didn't understand that, you know, he had to be born of water and spirit. Okay, but Christ answers him. Gives him the answer to his question. Sometimes God winks at our ignorance when we do react and think in the flesh and ask a question, well, Lord, I don't get How do you expect this to happen? And God knows where the answer is going to come from. He already knows what he's going to tell you. But some people let their carnality get in the way of receiving the spiritual answer. Nicodemus is not one of those that said, well, that doesn't make any sense, and then just left. Because some people come to church, they'll sit on the pew, they may be saved on their way to heaven, but they've got a question that they're desiring to have answered to God, and they don't understand the answer because they're not thinking spiritually. They're thinking carnally. And they get rubbed the wrong way because they don't receive the answer the way that God desired them to receive the answer. And they think, well, that doesn't make sense, and then they walk out the door mad. Kind of like, like that uh, rich young ruler who was all down to follow Christ until he heard, sell everything you own. Because he didn't really get the message. It wasn't about the riches. It was about the hold that the riches had on him. He wasn't willing to really follow after Christ. Because James and John and Peter, what'd they do? They left the fishing boats and everything on the fishing boats to follow after Christ. They gave up everything. James and John turned around and said, Hey, Zeb, see you later, Dad. And they were off. But see, Nicodemus, instead of running away, he says, That doesn't make sense to the flesh. But what did he do? He asked another question. He said, I don't get it, but I believe that you know the answer, so I'm going to keep asking the question. Then we get down to verse number 9. 
How can these things be? Before this, you know, Jesus just told them, must be born again. Then he talks about the Spirit being like the wind. You can't know where he's going to come from, when he's going to blow. We didn't know that he's going to show up Friday night, but I'm sure glad that he did. We don't know where he's going to show up, but we do know that when he shows up, he's there. And then Nicodemus says, how can these things be? Not, what do you mean? He's saying, okay, I understand what, but how? And you may be thinking right now, well, Nicodemus is pretty stubborn. Don't rub off on him. How many times did God have to deal with you before you got saved? How many questions do we have daily walking with Christ after we've been saved that we can look hindsight or we can look at somebody else and say, man, why don't they, why don't they get it? Well, Nicodemus has accepted that what he said is true. Now he's saying, well, how? How does that work? Okay, I get what you say, but explain to me how it works. It's one thing to know about grace. It's another thing to know how grace works, to have seen it in your life. It's one thing to know about faith. It's another thing to know how to use faith. It's one thing to know what prayer is. It's another thing to know how to, how to get a hold of God by grabbing the horns of the altar. Nicodemus is asking, how do I make those things happen in my life? And then after this, Jesus goes into an answer and says unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? He's saying, you know what the, the Scriptures say, the Old Testament. He's saying, I'm not telling you anything new. He's just saying, you've been looking at it from the eyes of the law. You need to look at it from the eyes of grace. Then, verse number 11, Very, very last saying to thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. In other words, he's saying, Everything I've told you has come from heaven. What John said later that we already read. He bears witness of the Father because he's seen what the Father has done. And the Father bears witness of him because the Father sent him. Then verse number 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Jesus answers all of Nicodemus' questions on how, essentially, God could walk among men and then make a way for man to have their sins not just pushed back but forgiven, gone, and then abide in heaven forevermore. To have eternal life. But why did he get those answers? Because he asked. Nicodemus's uncertainty was not a hindrance to him walking or living the way that God wanted him to. Now you can believe what you want to, but I've seen, Bible says, you'll know a tree by the fruit. That it bear, well, what about Nicodemus? Well, I find that Nicodemus took up for those that followed after Christ in the councils. I find that when Christ was crucified, Nicodemus showed up with some linen clothing and some 400-pound weight of spices and herbs to give him a proper burial. Now, I don't know about you, but I personally believe Nicodemus got saved. I mean, again, the Bible doesn't tell us. We'll find out when we get to heaven. But he had some, he had some fruit where others, and he knew the peer pressure of the others to say, well, hey, these guys are doing something different than us. And he's saying, yeah, but is it wrong? He's sitting there and he says, but what does God have to say on the issue? I believe he got saved, but why? Because he asked questions and he listened to the answer. He was confronted with something new and he wanted to understand it and how that new thing affected his life. So the first group of uncertainty you know, the things that we don't know. The way that we can first confront that is to ask the questions, and what will that do? That will draw us closer to God. If I never am faced with anything new, I will never grow. If as a Christian, if I don't face new problems, I won't learn how the grace of God is sufficient to handle those problems. I won't learn how faith can take me through those problems. My witness as an epistle known and read of all men will be incomplete if I don't face new things in my life. Unless I am willing to confront new things, not talking about our faith, but new things in life, new things as a disciple, as a witness of Christ, I won't be able to reach everybody that Christ intended me to reach. The questions that we have as saved believers 
are meant to draw us closer to God, not further away. Because the new things do not erase the old. What did Christ tell the negative? You know what the scriptures say. All the, the Old Testament says that one day there's going to be a Savior and that He's coming and that these things are temporary, that the law was temporary. He's saying, you know all that. He's saying, behold, everything that was prophesied is now fulfilled. He's saying, you know it. Now you just need to believe that it's happened. It's not going to overwrite what we've already known. It's going to add to. It's going to enhance. It's going to clarify. If you've been saved any length of time, you can go back to one of your favorite verses right after you got saved. You're going to know a whole lot more about that verse. Why? Because you've grown. You've lived. You understand now maybe where that person was when they wrote that and you get a little bit more context through the Spirit saying he wrote that when he was about in the same spot that you were when he felt the same way that you did. What is it? Those are questions that add to our faith. Add to our knowledge of the things of God. Make us a more capable workman. Because again, study show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed. I can answer those that have questions of me because I'm not ashamed of what I know because of what I've learned in the scriptures. Then you've got the group that when they're faced with something that they don't understand, they try to make it up on their own. Their uncertainty leads to further unbelief. Their uncertainty pulls them further away from the things of God. That's the Jews that disputed with the disciples of John the Baptist. What did they do when they heard something new? They doubled down on what they already knew. There are some people, and I'm not gonna, not gonna name names, but one of them might be standing up, you know, front right now. That sometimes when they're faced with something, their first reaction is, "But well, I can't be right. That's different than what I think." Now, why might that be? Maybe because he's been, you know, involved in debate his entire life, and his natural instinct is, no, I'm right. Because in a debate room, I can make anybody think that I'm right. I mean, used to, I'd just wait and sit down and see which side had the fewest amount of people arguing on it, and I'd wait until all of them were done, and I'd get up and I'd just, you know, tear everything down that everybody else said. I mean, I just, I just liked doing it. I didn't even, you know, didn't matter if, it's just what I like doing. But some people's reactions are, well, if it didn't come from, you know, us, then it can't be right. Right? If, if the Pharisee or if the teacher, if the rabbi down at the synagogue didn't get up and say it, then it can't be true. If that preacher over at that church said it, then surely it can't be true. Well, their first reality, they are so closed off and isolated from everything else that they essentially cut themselves off from the world. Jesus said that we are not of the world, but we are in it. Those that when, they're, when they have a question, when they have uncertainty, when their first reaction is, is to close the doors and, you know, drop the, or raise the drawbridge and, you know, put everything up on the battlements and say, hey, that's not true. Don't bring that in here. What they're doing is, is they're cutting themselves off from everybody else. What should have happened is like Nicodemus, they should have come and said, hey, this is what we know. Here's what you've said. Explain to me why you believe what you believe. Because I know why I believe what I believe. But explain to me. Uncertainty in others is an opportunity for us to explain what we believe. To show them why we are certain of what we believe. Because they're uncertain, that's why they're raising the question. But what they did when they came doesn't say that they asked or that they inquired. It says in verse number 25, there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews. Well, there arose a question out of what? Dispute. Strife. They came and they started arguing with John's disciples and then John's disciples had a question. The Jews didn't have a question. They were certain. You're wrong. And John's disciples said, well, are we wrong? 
Now, we've already dealt with the Jews. Then there's the third type of uncertainty, which is where we've been neglectful. Sometimes we know that we've heard it, but we don't know why it's right. We don't know why we do what we do. We're convicted of it enough to do it, but we're not convicted enough to know why we do it. Because John the Baptist's disciples came back and said, well, hang on a second, are they right? Because now that we think about it, they've raised a few good points. Why does Jesus allow just anybody to come to him? And then John the Baptist, I can see him, he's sitting there, man, y'all know this. They're saying, I preached this before. I wonder if he pulled one of them where he said, hey, uh, I wonder if you guys would have been accepted by them Jews over there before you were baptized. He said, I wonder if you would have been those others. Anybody can come to them. Because how many of us would have been worth the powder to blow away? Right? None. But their uncertainty, because of the other person, they doubled down, they've isolated themselves, they've cut themselves off from anything new. And you can do that, but you're going to be spiritually anemic because you're not going to understand when you don't know. At least John the Baptist's disciples knew, hey, we don't know, we need to go find the answer. They went to the right source. They didn't go to themselves. They went to somebody that knew more than they did. But they didn't know because they were neglectful to apply the things that they had already been taught. One thing to hear, it's another thing to, you know, carve it into the fleshy table of our souls, to etch it onto the, you know, foundation of our heart so that when we go out, we know it. David said, that word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. What does hid it mean? Nobody can steal it away because they don't know where it's at. I know why and I've hid it down so that nobody can take it away. I can explain to others why I believe what I believe. But see, these people couldn't. They said, well, we, we tried to tell them, but then they, they raised some questions. John knew the answer to the question. But those Jews left. They weren't there to hear the answer that John gave. The disciples came to John, and those Jews didn't get the answer. Now, granted, I've been faced with questions. I've never heard that before. I've been over at the jail. People bring up doctrines from, you know, other teachings. I'm not acquainted with those because I don't believe that way. But I do tell them, give me a week, and I'll either give the answer to Brother Josh or I'll ask him to see if he already knows the answer. Or if, you know, he doesn't have the answer for you by next week, I'll bring it in two weeks. I'll go find it. Now, that's not necessarily neglect. What is that? That's just something new. Now we're back at the beginning again. Okay, well, what are all these things about? It's being confronted with information that you've never received before. Now, John's disciples have never been asked this question before, or else they would have had the answer. But from this day forward, I do hope that if they ever had that issue brought up again, they knew the answer, and they were able to give the answer to those people. But they didn't know because they didn't apply. One thing about Nicodemus, he applied everything that he learned. That's why he rose to the ranks of the Pharisee. He was able to do all the duties of his job. John the Baptist applied the things that God preached to him out in the wilderness before he preached them to other people. That's why he was able to answer his disciples. But those disciples didn't take what they had heard and turned it into something that they could again say to others. They thought, well, yeah, that's great, but I don't need that. That's great. They were sitting there one day, John's preaching, and they were saying, yeah, that's great. But you can, can you go back and cover that other thing? I really don't care about that. Really don't need that today. Maybe I'll teach on that tomorrow, come back around to it, but I really need this part over here. They neglected something. They didn't apply it. 
And as a result, it led to him being uncertain. Yeah, I dare to say that if somebody other than John the Baptist was there to answer that question, those people might have been convinced of the Jews to go back to the synagogue with them. What they had been believing was wrong. Now, you can't tell me that that wasn't one of the snares of the devil. Those Jews coming there and doubting, trying to argue with them. Well, how many people do we know? As soon as they're faced with something, as soon as somebody asks them a question, as soon as the situation rolls up that they've never faced before, boom, out of church. Thankfully, these disciples of John the Baptist weren't that way. They went back to the preacher and said, Hey, explain to me. Teach me. Cover this answer. And he's saying, I already have. You just didn't realize it because it hadn't been applied. Right now, those are the types of questions. Why those people in this chapter were asking those questions. But real quick, before we're done. You can be certain of anything. It's free country. You have the right to be wrong. You can be certain of anything. That doesn't mean that you're right. Uncertainty is, well, let's start here. You, get saved. you know you're saved. When you first get saved, that's all you know is that you're saved. If all that you were certain of is that you're saved and somebody would ask you why and you never became discipled in the things of God, you never understood or had somebody else teach you and go through apologetics, show you why we believe what we believe, if all you know is that you're saved, you're not going to be able to answer much. You're not going to be able to confront much because it's not going to take much to upset that person's apple cart. Uncertainty is the seed. Now, faith, we know. The opposite of that is doubt. We've already covered it. Uncertainty is not faith or doubt. Somewhere in between. You believe it enough to hold on to it, but you don't believe it enough to plan it. You like some school, I don't even know if they still do this anymore. But used to, you'd go to lunch, you'd drink your milk, you'd come back to your class, you'd bring your milk carton with you, you'd wash it out, you'd cut the top off of it, put some topsoil in there, plant a seed in it. You know it's good enough to plant, but you're not planting it out in the garden. You're not putting it out in the vineyard. You're holding on to it and saying, all right, I believe that I need this, but I don't know where it should go, so I'm going to leave it right here for now. A milk carton's only so big. The roots of a seed in a milk carton aren't going to get very deep. In a milk carton, it's going to sprout. You're going to have something to see. Well, yeah, what I believe. I knew this was worth planting. But you're still not reaping all the benefits of actually applying it to your heart. Letting it take root deep down in your soul. You're holding on to it out here. Well, I know I need this. I just don't know why. I don't know where. And then by the time you do need it it's been in the milk carton so long it's already died the seed's still in there but it ran out of nutrients in that topsoil it ran out of water because we neglected it it'll grow as long as it's got but it can't grow very big in a milk carton it's not going to get very strong in a milk carton you put that milk carton out in a tornado milk carton's gone Tornado doesn't even have to get close. Amen. Right? A strong breeze would tip it over. But if you were to let it take root in your soul, no matter what you're confronted with, you may not be certain of what you've been confronted with, but you know, well, this is true. But like Nicodemus, Lord, how is this the right thing for that situation? Lord, how's my faith going to get me through this? Lord, what do you want me to pray? How do I pray according to your will? Lord, how do you want me to walk through this storm? That's not a what question. That's a question that brings us closer to God. We were certain that this is the right thing to do. We planted it deep down in here. But Lord, how do I apply this thing that you've already planted in my life to what's in front of me? That's asking for direction. That's not doubting. In fact, Proverbs says, any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Why? Because God gives to all men, but he gives to all men liberally. You want to know things about God, God will give you the answer. And he'll heap it on until you can't take no more. But that doesn't do us any good if we don't let that wisdom take root down here. Then there are those people 
that when they're confronted with, here, here's the seed. It's worked for me. It's worked for everybody else here. This seed's for you. They're certain that they don't need it. Okay? Can't help those people. They're going to either have to come to themselves or God's going to have to harden their heart so much that it breaks like he did Pharaoh. But that's outside of me. I can't do anything with other people's seeds. But when those people do come to me and say, why? It's a whole lot better for me to be able to say, because this, than, I don't know, you make a good point, I'll be back tomorrow. That's our fault if we've never been confronted with that before. You say, hey, I don't, I've never heard that before. I'm going to go back. I, I got an idea what the answer is. I can tell you what the Bible says right now. I just don't know why that's right. I don't understand the question really because I don't know, you know what doctrine is. I don't know why you believe that. I got to go look that up. Then come back later. No shame in that. You can't be expected to do anything with something you've never known about before. But when it's something that we've heard preached before, when it's something that we've done a devotion on, when it's something that God's shown it to us out of the Scripture, then we're without excuse to be able to answer them. But the thing is, when we were confronted with it, we weren't convinced that that's what we needed. Why? Because we had too many other things in our garden, like we heard last night, and we don't have enough room to plant what God wants us to plant in there. So we put it in a little milk carton and we say, well, one of these days after a harvest or something, I'll plant that in the garden, but right now we don't have room for it. Well, in order to love God more, you've got to love something else or less. You've got to make room in the garden for the new things that God gives you or else they're never going to grow. Now, all that being said, uncertainty Is not, I mean, just like anything else. Be angry and sin not. It's not sin to be angry. This is a sin to hate, but it's not a sin to be angry. It's a sin to act on anger. Right? Your flesh not being saved, it's not a sin to have the thought. It's a sin to dwell on the thought, to act on the thought. As soon as we have the thought, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. Help me get through it. It isn't, you know, it's not a sin to be uncertain. Because sometimes uncertainty will draw you closer to God. But those that dwell in uncertainty, they don't want an answer. Those that just don't know what to do and they shut down, uncertainty leads to inaction. That's why it's so effective and why the devil tries to bring about uncertainty in people's lives. Because if you don't know what to do, you won't do anything. The people in the chapter we read, they knew. Well, two of them did. Nicodemus and the disciples of John knew. I don't know, so I'm going to go ask the one that knows more. I'm going to ask the one that, one, who was God, and two, was closer to God than I was for the answer. Then the other group said, well, I've never heard that before, but it's wrong. And then they went to go argue with the people. That thought different than they did. But two of them had enough common sense, hey, we're going to go do something. But a whole lot of people, they, when they're uncertain, they just shut down. Well, I know that God wants me to do something, I just don't know what. Well, why don't you go ask him? Well, no, I know this is where God wants me to be, I just don't know how he wants me to do this thing. Well, why don't you ask him? Why don't you get in here and ask him? Because if you don't, you're not going to do anything. And if you don't do anything, the devil won. I've said this before. I'll probably say it again. But the Bible does say the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of the living God. The gate doesn't keep things out. Keeps things in. God put the gate around hell. Because hell has to enlarge its borders every day. The gate is to keep people in hell from getting out of hell. But we let the devil throw gates up to keep us pinned in. Uncertainty keeps us pinned in. We don't know what to do, don't know where to go. We're staying there. And the devil's just going to put a fence around us and say, all right, stay there. We're going to put this gate around you, say you can't get out and affect anybody that doesn't know the truth. You can't shine a light to anybody when you got a gate around you. But the church of the living God marches right through them. 
The devil tries to keep the gate shut. We can just walk right through them if God says walk right through them. We can go tell anyone in there who needs to hear about it. Because the devil knows his faith sealed. Those that have already died, their faith sealed. But he's trying to keep us pinned in so that we can't get out there and make a difference in those that still have the ability to make a choice. But uncertainty keeps us in the cage. Uncertainty keeps us on the sidelines. Uncertainty will keep you feeling like you're in the dryer as it's tumbling you around. You don't know which way's up because you've got no roots down there. You've got some in a milk carton, but those aren't strong enough to hold you when the winds start blowing, when the storms come, because you had too much other stuff in your garden. You knew it was good enough to plant, but it wasn't good enough to plant in that most treasured place, in that place where, you know, the things that you live by, the things that you desire, that's where you keep those. You didn't plant it there. You put it somewhere else. And it wasn't strong enough when the winds came for you too to be certain. And as a result, you don't know what to do. But I knew that milk carton was around here somewhere. Milk carton's gone. Wind done blowing it away. You got to go get another seed from God and this time plant it. Put it in the ground to where it can grow up to what it needs to be. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Forms app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.